Hey man, good morning LCM. Today is February 10th, 2019. The title of today's sermon is Master Ship Builder. Master Ship Builder. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 10. This is going to be a good day, y'all. We are having such a good time in the mornings on Sunday morning getting together as a team, as a group of people, and hearing from the Lord and creating sermons together. I think this might be the 12th sermon of, of 2019. This is the 11th sermon in a row that we're going to team teach. 12 sermons. We're, we're, batting, uh, we're going 11 for 12 here and having more than one person on the stage just because this church believes in being a band of survivors. We don't believe that you should be doing this alone. We're not against having a single person preach a sermon. But we are trying to show you and demonstrate by our lives that this has to take community. It, we must continue to live in community. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 10. Let's do this in the NASB, if we will, Megan. There you go. Already there. <laughs> yeah. uh, according to the grace of God, which was given to me, like a wise master builder. Say master builder with me. Master, master builder. builder. I laid a foundation and another is building on it. But each man must be careful how he builds on it. Did you hear the words that came forth this morning? We have a a word in tongues from Elder Charlie. We had a dual interpretation. Part of it that caught me was it was coming from 1 Samuel. This idea of those who came to the cave of Adullam who were distressed, discontented, indebted. They came and they became mighty men as they acknowledged the king of all before anyone else had acknowledged him as king. That God was encouraging us today not to just give us ordinary bread, but to give us extraordinary bread here in this place today. That not You just don't need to grab a sword. You need to have an extraordinary sword that we can use today. And that's what I feel like the Lord is giving. Part of the other uh, word that came forth, I want to remind us, I don't want to move on as if we having, we're having two separate parts of a service. As if the worship isn't speaking to us to lead us to be ready for the word of God and the word of God is not pushing us back towards worship. Part of the word that came forth was that our function must be done. Let me rephrase that because it was said better than what I just said it. That your function must be done. It's one thing to say our function, right? That that disperses the responsibility too much. When the Lord is saying to us, your function must be done. Insert your name. Insert your calling. Insert your mezuzah there to find out what must be done for this body. It cannot be undone. That means we can't be without it being done, and it can't be undone that once you've given this to the Lord, it's without revocation. The Word of God said to come out of the cave, come and speak to me, and I will equip you for the task that God has given you. I found a scrap sheet of paper on the stand and wrote that down because that was moving today. The Lord of all creation has spoken to us, and what He is teaching us through a band of Survivor series is that we are together. We have to be together. You're not ever going to hear us get away from that message. If you don't like that message, you can just move on to another church because we're going to keep preaching it. That you must live in community. You cannot do this by yourself. The greatest among us is not designed to do it by yourself. But when we look here and find out what a master builder is, what do you think of when someone says a master? Expert. The best. Depends on how you're looking at it. Are Are you thinking about it in a noun? Is it an expert? A teacher? Someone who has more than a bachelor's degree, but less than a PhD. Just saying, we got a lot of engineers up in here who, uh, who have done a lot of stuff. Do you think of a worker? Do you think of an artisan? Someone who's qualified to teach other people? Do you think of someone who's skilled and proficient? Because that's what we are supposed to be in the kingdom. We are supposed to become masters at the craft that God has given us. Masters, not in everything. We're not a master of all. We are the master of what God has given us. He is the master of all. There is no lack that He has. What we are working towards in this series as we talk about a master ship builder is trying to get to the idea of a master's level. Now, some of you who did not do well in school, that just made you really tense. It's okay. In this place, you can have an honorary degree. It's all right. If you get the skill, we give you the degree. It's all right. You don't have to worry about all that. 
but the idea that we are looking to become proficient at the tasks that our master has assigned to us. This idea of being a master is not a quick process. You realize that if you're going to become a master, whether you're a nerd and grew up watching Star Wars, you want to become a master Jedi, that takes a long time. If you're going to become a master in anything, it takes a long time. Isn't that the funny part when a young person, say a teenager or something, they think they have mastered a skill? What do they mean by master? They can fumble their way through it and only cause minor damages. I'm a master driver. Yeah, you drive like you're a master, but you're definitely not. Are you, do you even have your eyes open as you're doing this right now? But dad, I can drift. I can drift like a boss. Yeah, but that's in the neighborhood. God help all the fire hydrants around us. Just, 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 came, just came off the top of my head. I don't know, as I looked at the front row. <laughs> but it was raining. Yeah, but you were going 70 coming around a curve. So. What does it take to have the characteristics of a master? I was thinking about this today, and I, I consulted some of our, uh, our master's level folks today. I talked to Charlie and I talked to Baj. I said, you guys are, are masters at life. Here's what I learned from them. A master has a deep understanding of the specific components of, a, of an idea or a project. They understand how everything integrates and they understand the overall function and design of something. If you want to find a master of planning, talk to Charlie Brown. Amen. He does it without trying. He does it because he is amazingly good at understanding the small parts and know how they fit into the whole. You want to look at a master craftsman, a master mechanic? Talk to Bosch. The, the brother understands things that, that I just kind of smile and nod, and he has to be kind to me because it's way over my head on most things that he's saying. You know, some other characteristics of being master, they're often humble people. If you have mastered a skill you're very aware of the things that you are not a master in. Speaking of our elders, you won't hear Charlie say that he is a master in planning. I'm making him uncomfortable, but I love him and I'm trying to honor him. He wouldn't call himself a master planner. He just, he'd say something like, you know, I tinker around in that. Or, no, Charlie is, is one of the most capable men I've ever met in my life. If you ask Baj how many languages he speaks, do you know what he says? A few. So, Baj is not being falsely humble. He understands languages beyond belief. So what he also understands is what we're saying is, how many can you speak? How many can you function in? And he's saying, how many am I at a master's level in? And he says, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not very fluent in many languages. And I've never been to a country where he can't speak to the people in their native language. See, a master has enough skill to know what they are good at and what they aren't, no matter how the rest of us may view them. I kid around with folks, and, and the truth is, somebody asked me, do you play the piano? And I'll say, no. Because, because I used to teach music, and I understand what a real piano player can do, and I understand that I'm not at that level. I'm not putting myself down. I'm not being falsely humble. I know what a master really can do. Yeah. And I know... That I can't do that. Another thing, they're often humble. Another thing is they draw, they are drawn to other masters. If you are really good at something, if you're a really good carpenter, if you're somebody like Rick Lawhon, who's good at many, many things, he is drawn to other people who are equally as skilled in whatever the craft is, whether it's the same craft or whether it's something different. These are the things that we can see and appreciate in others. You're no longer threatened by the mastery of someone else. You know why? You actually appreciate it because you know what it took to get there. You're ready to learn from someone else. Regardless of their age or stage or upbringing, you realize if they have something that they have mastered, you want to spend time with them. This is the attitude that this church is trying to portray in every way. We had a young man open us up in the service today. You know why? Because he's working on his craft. And he heard something from the Lord, and we wanted him to do that so he might grow through the stages towards mastery now. This is what we desire. A, a master is also ready to share their knowledge and skill with others. But that's only 
those who are serious. Anybody ever asked Baj to help you with any language things? Okay, don't raise your hand, right? <laughs> Anybody ever asked Baj to help teach you a language? And then you went through like one session? And then you moved on to something else? The better masters understand and they will respond to your hunger and to your approach. The hungry you are, the more serious you are, the more that they will give you. They will give you the entirety of their life because they love it and they want to share it with you. But if you're not serious, they go, okay, well, won't you come on over to my house? Won't you come at this time because it's convenient for me? Because they want to see if you're actually hungry for it. Wow. Anybody ever missed out on mastery, the masters around you because you just weren't willing to put in the time? Come on, we're going to be a group, a band, not only of survivors, not only of brothers, not only of the restored and so many things that we just learned. We're going to become a group of craftsmen in this place today. Amen. Turn with us to uh, Genesis chapter 6. Say there when you're there. As you go to Genesis 6, we're going to look at Noah who spent just a little bit of time mastering the craftsmanship of building a ship yeah everybody knows the difference between a ship and a boat right they float uh, that's not a difference anyway you can put a boat inside of a ship but you cannot put a ship inside of a boat that's the technical mariners version of how to describe that so what we have here genesis 6 verse 14 so make yourself an ark of cypress wood Make rooms in it and coat it with pitch inside and out. This is how you are to build it. So what's clear is, did Noah come up with this plan on his own? No. No, this was a heavenly pattern. The result of him following the exact instructions that God gave him from, from heaven resulted in salvation for him, his family, and all of mankind. You and I are sitting here today because God spoke to Noah and said, this is how you are to build it. And his obedience to that building plan has resulted in us living on earth right here, right now. What did it take for Noah to build something like this? <laughs> a, well, a long time. So over 100 years. Any of you guys have a, an extra 100 years or so? <laughs> To just build a ship? Let's put up the first slide. This is not the actual ark. I just want to preface it with that. There's a hand drawing I found in my Bible. Now, this is, this is a replica that has been made, I think, within the past 10 or 15 years uh, that's located in Kentucky. And the dimensions mentioned in the, the, the accounting in Genesis is 450 feet long. Now, this is kind of like the explanation of, well, there's 1.2 million people in this town and Houston, greater Houston area is, you know, roughly around 8 to 10 million people. We get to interacting with numbers we don't have much relativity with. So think of a 45-story building, 45 floors, then laid on the ground, and that's what that is. That's a huge, huge structure. It's 75 feet wide. So roughly seven stories wide. And it's 45 feet high. Roughly four stories high. One man with possibly his sons, three sons, building this for 100 years. Go to the next slide. Obviously, this is also not the actual picture of what was happening. Because what we see is a couple of man lifts, a Chevy truck, a generator. So there's probably power tools. There's also uh, porta toilets on the side. That's definitely modern day. But um, imagine when we think of constructing something, we automatically put it within the framework of our own culture. This is our own culture. Machinery, tools, manpower, you name it. And I think it took somewhere around eight years, ten years for these guys to build this with machinery. Noah and possibly his three sons spent a hundred years building this exact same structure. Look how huge that is. Compare the size of just that white Chevy truck to the rest of that structure. It's enormous. God calls us to do enormous things. And usually well beyond our resources, well beyond our own abilities. Because it's about the process 
of building that's making us into a master shipbuilder. Yeah. You guys think Noah was a master shipbuilder when he began? No. no. But he sure did become one after he did what the Lord had instructed him to do. Absolutely. You think you're going to be a master in your calling when you begin? No. Of course not. And you should be developing every day towards being a master in that, in that field. Let's turn to Exodus chapter 31. Exodus chapter 31. As we talk about being master craftsmen here in this place today, having master shipbuilders, I want to th start off with one, the very first one that I thought of when we began studying for this. In Exodus chapter 31 and verse 1, say there when you're there. It says this, Then the Lord said to Moses, See, I have chosen Bezalel, son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. Do you know what is interesting about Bezalel? Is that he was the first, as he is introduced, he's one of the first people in the entirety of the Bible to say that the Lord has chosen someone as they're introduced to the story. That didn't happen with Moses. Moses had to get introduced to the Lord. You, had to, you see his story develop and then the Lord begins to speak to him. You, you, you don't see that as much with Abraham, although he was chosen. What you see is that Bezalel, right? Everybody's, everybody's favorite Bible character. Good old Bezalel. When you're talking and thinking through the mighty men of the Bible, of course you start off with Bezalel. Of course you do. No. But the Lord had chosen him. What an incredible and a special man. He falls in the category of an Abraham. In Genesis 18, 19, the Lord says, I have chosen him so that he will lead and direct his children and his household after him to keep the ways of the Lord. You hear this in Isaiah 42. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. The Lord is speaking of Israel there, but it's also of Israel's Messiah. Whatever you can look at and see about the nation, you can see and say about the king. In Luke 9, about the Messiah directly, verse 35, it says, A voice came from the cloud saying what? This is my son whom I have chosen. Listen to him. How important is it to be chosen? How important is it for God to actually select you and, and call you and impart something to you? This is what's going on here. I have chosen Bezalel for a purpose out of the tribe of Judah. Look at verse 3. I have filled him with the Spirit of God. Why are we so intent on everyone in this room being filled with the powerful Spirit of God? Why is that? Why are we so unashamed? A man who is special in biblical proportions had to be filled with the very breath of heaven. He had to be filled with the Spirit of God so that he might be able to accomplish. But look what else he's given. I have filled him with the Spirit of God and with skill. Somebody say skill. Skill. Wasn't it nice to be around people who have some skill in something? Yes. Yes. You ever walked into a store and someone behind the counter is trying to help you and you realize this person is getting paid way too little because they are, are you understand why they're getting paid so little? Because they have no skill to be able to help you? No, just, no, you do carry this product. It's right over there. I can't get it because it's behind, behind the counter. Would you, it's right there. I can see it. Lord, help me, right? People who have skill, they're able to function and do the technical work. Can I encourage you, for everyone in this room, that the job, the vocation that God has put you in, you know what it's there for? So you can learn how to develop your skill. Amen. Whatever your field is, if it's a salesperson, you know what the skill is? It's not sell selling, it's the idea of how to learn to interact with people. Well, what a good profession for you if you're going to go into the ministry. If, if you are working at a job and God has put a shovel in your hands right now, you know what the skill is? For you to be diligent and become excellent in the small things that God may exalt you and lift you up in due time and put you where he wants you. Can you be faithful in the skill items? Are you going to be good at the job that God has put you in? Let God work through the J-O-B in your life. Amen. That's not very spiritual. No, it's amazingly spiritual. Problem is, is you put spirituality in a different category and you're allowing it to keep you to be unfaithful in the things that God has put before you. Skill. He's filled with the Spirit of God. He's filled, he's filled with skill and ability. 
What's the difference between skill and ability? An ability is a process where you learn to implement the things that you have learned. You are being able to put it into actual practice. It's almost like we just have to do it again, folks. You have some type of persistence, pers- per- some type of tenacity about you that causes you to just do it again. I know this was last week, but I'm going to go back. to Turn to your neighbor and say, just do it again. Just do it again. We've got to be filled with the very Spirit of God. We've got to be filled with skill, s- filled with ability, knowledge. Man, you've got to have some discernment about you. I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to pick on my son for just a second and embarrass my son in front of all. Amen. My, my son had a, had, a, had a beautiful accident about a year ago in a vehicle. In his vehicle. He showed great skill in that accident. My son was, was trying to be amazingly obedient. He received a text message while he was driving. Problem number one. The text message said, hey, I need this. So my son stopped in the middle of the road. Just stopped. I see this, I will obey. Stopped to fulfill the text because he did not want to be texting while driving. Someone behind him was surprisingly enough not paying attention and hit him. Now, it's hard, I, in that moment, this was the day before we left on a mission trip. And I was like, I want to be mad, but I can't really be mad because he did exactly what he was asked to do. He was trying to be com- amazingly obedient and compliant. But what my son, who was 17 at the time, did not understand, he did not have the right knowledge. He did not have any discernment of to know when. You know, if you had waited two more minutes and got where you were going promise you it would have been okay then too. Anybody ever uh, had an accident of things because you just didn't understand when God was trying to speak to you for you to function in something? Absolutely. He told you something and you got all excited or you, you, you dropped everything else and you, you messed up at the job because God spoke to you as if those things were separated from each other? Yeah, we need to be filled with some knowledge. And in all kinds of crafts, to make artistic designs for work in gold, silver, and bronze, to cut and set stones, to work in wood, and to engage in all kinds of Practice. crafts and craftsmanship. The, can, do you hear this list? Do you hear how Bezalel, how incredible this man is? It's not just one single field. The Lord gave him these skills where anything, gold, got it. Silver, I understand the process. Bronze, no problem. I can cut and set stones. I can, I can be a carpenter. I can engage in any kind of craftsmanship that is needed. Why does God give this man this? In this passage, the Lord is wanting to build the tabernacle for his presence. Do you know what God imparts things to you for? So that he can build his very house. This is always why he imparts something to you. He's given you something. It is from the heavens that has been input into you. Why? So that his house may be built. Let's continue on in verse 6. Verse 6. Moreover, I have appointed Aholiab, son of Ahisamach, of the tribe of Dan, to help him. Also, I have given him skill. Everybody say skill. To all the craftsmen, to make everything I have commanded you. Now, is it a... Uh, a powerful thing that God has ordained, chosen, and anointed Bezalel. Yes, Yes, absolutely. The work of God wouldn't get done if Bezalel was not anointed for that task. Let's work our way through this this, uh, relationship that they have. Ohaliah was appointed, chosen by God to assist him and was anointed just as much as Bezalel was. Bezalel was in charge of overseeing everything. Oholiah was mainly responsible for helping his brother accomplish the task. How many times has God appointed us to help a brother with a task they are anointed for, but we end up hurting them more than helping them because we're vying for that leadership position in the task? 
What about those times, let's say you guys who do prison. I think this is a great opportunity to constantly work with each other, dying for each other's vision, knowing that I need my brothers and my brothers need me. That depending on that morning, whoever the Lord is anointing to lead out with that word, to lead out with that worship, the others are going to come in and assist. You know, what our culture and really what our sinful nature is constantly vying for is that number one position. You know, you see the Olympics. The guy standing on the highest part of the podium has the gold medal around his neck. They're beaming from ear to ear. What do the other two look like that have the bronze and the silver? You came this close and you failed. Because everybody wants that number one position. But when we see the kingdom of God in operation, the relationships that are required to accomplish building the temple or the tabernacle of the living God, it is not about a number one position. It's about the position that God has anointed you for. When you step outside of what God has appointed you to do, you also step outside of the anointing that he has provided for you to do it. Come on. That's good. There are no lone rangers in the kingdom of God. Zero. Another part of our culture that just pours uh, gas on fire about this concept is movies. You know, uh, I'm not going to name them because we're not going to promote movies on our sermons. All I'm going to say is that there are, there's a constant reminder that if you are that one guy that can take out all the enemies, you're that one guy that can solve every problem, then you are the hero of the story. Realize that the kingdom of God and, and real life is completely the opposite. That Bezalel would be nothing. He would have built nothing. Noah would have built nothing if there weren't others uh, next to him to uh, complete the task and build what God anointed him to do. Yeah. God demands that we live in covenant with each other. Yeah. That we live in community. This is one, one part of our church uh, culture that I love that we are adhering to the command from God to intertwine our lives. So when, yes, that when you step in this church, you're not only going to be attacked repeatedly with hugs and greetings and names that you can't remember. We're going to be all up in your business. Because what we're looking to do is fulfill the mandate that God has to intertwine our lives and live in covenant and community. Amen. You know, the guys uh, got through teaching this past Saturday in Acts 2 class about going in twos and governing in threes. This is a, a God-ordained principle that we see a whole lot of fulfilling because it takes community, a community of craftsmen to make everything that God has commanded us. Amen. I want to walk through just the, the names of these two men and their lineage and tell you the story that it reads. Bezalel means shadow of God. Shadow of God. His father, Uri, means light of God. And his father, her, means freedom. That a man who walks in the shadow of God, led by the light of God, is walking in the freedom of God. Amen. Come on, when God anoints you for a task, you're going to walk in the shadow of the Almighty. You're going to have his light and his fire leading you, and you will bring freedom to others as you operate according to your appointed position. Oholiab, let's look at his name. But before you go there, tell him, tell him what tribe they're from. Ah, Bezalel is from the tribe of Yehuda. From the tribe of Judah, the lion of the tribe of Judah. So you have the shadow of God being spurred on by the light of God as you're living in the freedom of God so that you may bring about the very kingdom of heaven here on this earth through the lion of the tribe of Judah. Come this on, is a beautiful picture. This is just what the, what the word of God has laid out for us. Now look at... Look at our next one. Next one, his partner in building the temple. Oholiab means tent of the father. Tent of the father. Ahisamach, his father. The one who trusted his brother. Come on, in his very name is the function of the lineage that he's carrying on. That is so incredible. Man. The idea of us all wanting to be the number one spot, right? Oholia up here is he's going, I am in the tent of my father who's trusted in his brothers. 
Where do you think he learned how to work with Bezalel the way he did? He was raised in it. He was brought up in it. He was under the shadow, the protection, the tent of the father who learned how to be a brother. Come on now, that's something special. And what tribe were they in, Pastor? Tribe of Dan, which means to judge. To have right judgment because you're dwelling in the tent of the Father. You're the one who has trusted in his brother. And that gives you the right discernment and judgment to be the right kind of help. Yeah, that's incredible. In, in, in uh, Nehemiah 11.35, it talks about the Benjamites where they're getting settled. And at the end of the verse, it talks about that they become a valley of craftsmen. These guys have bonded together, not just a single craftsman, not just a single person who can do this, but a group of people. Come on, isn't that exactly what we are building here in this place? Absolutely. Turn with us to Exodus 36, and let's see this continue. We are laying groundwork for not only this sermon, not only the next sermons that we're going to preach, but we are laying groundwork today for what the Lord is doing in our lives. Are you staying with us this morning? We, we, we haven't even gotten there yet, but what we're doing is we're laying the right foundation so that you can build upon it. Do you know what the Lord is trying to do through you, through our Acts classes, through our discipleship helps, through opening up our homes and having Bible studies, is to help you to become mastership builders in this house. Amen. That you can become craftsmen, and not just singularly, but the entire group, we can form a valley of the craftsmen. That we can be known as, yeah, those are those guys who all seem to be able to be a master's level at what they're doing. In Exodus 36, verse 2, it says this, Then Moses summoned Bezalel and Aholiab and every skilled person. Didn't just call one. Didn't just call the two men that we know by name. He called the entire group. When one man actually follows his calling and has a family, a brotherhood that he can do this with, and it begins to impact the nation of people around him, this is what you get. You Moses summoned Bezalel, Aholiab, and every skilled person to whom the Lord had given ability. Everybody say given ability. Given ability. Who gave it to him? The Lord did. He gave them something. He put something within them. And who was willing to come? Say, I'm willing. I'm willing. And to do the work. As I was looking at this passage today, it just struck me that this is exactly what we are to do. This gives us the process. The Word of God, surprisingly enough, gives us a pathway that we need every single time. And as I saw this, the idea that God had given them the ability. What has God put within you? What has He dropped within your heart? What has He given you as what we call at this church a mezuzah statement? We're we're saying we're using the Jewish idea of having a a little small scroll on each entrance to the door that's not in your house, that's not to an unclean area. You have it there. It's supposed to be reminding you of the purpose of God's people. We use that term to say, what has God called you to do? What is your mezuzah statement, man? What is your mezuzah statement, husbands? What is God calling you? What What skill has he put within you? may seem kind of like a simple thing. We hear this all the time. Do you know what I know as your pastor? That there are many in the room who struggle with just understanding what God has called you to do, and we end up running in the wrong lane. We end up running somewhere else for something that God hasn't skilled us to do, but we're working really hard at it. The first thing that we see is the Lord has to give you an ability to do something. No matter how hard I work, this guy isn't going to be good enough to be in the NBA. Just not going to happen. No amount of, of effort on my part, no amount of training will get me to that level. Just not going to happen. There are many things in the world. I don't know why I picked that one. That was random. But I can spend my entire life striving, struggling, and straining and never achieve a master level if I'm fighting against the very thing that God has put within me. You've got to be faithful to develop the skills that God has given you. That is not a small thing. It's something that's easy to understand and hard to put into practice. If God has called you to be a pastor and you're wanting to be an apostle. You know that will create some struggles inside of you? If you're wanting to be the point person, the tip of the spear, and God has said, I've made you to be a fantastic second. I've made you to be a fantastic assistant to the guy who's going to be the tip of the spear. I've called you to be a Silas type figure and you want to be the Paul figure. You will struggle 
your entire life, and you know what you're going to think? That the problem's with everybody else. Yeah, they, don't they just don't see my greatness, Pastor. Yep. They don't understand. I'm going to keep doing it, and it's just part of the struggle, I guess. No, you've got to make sure that you are working in what God has given you to do. You've got to be faithful to develop skills that He gave you. This is the apprenticeship level. You just made it in the door. You are in the kingdom. You have things to offer. But you're untrained. You're undisciplined. You're undiscipled at this point. Hey, folks, if you're going to be a master's level person, you know the first thing you got to do is you got to see what the Lord has actually skilled you to do. If you don't start there, everything else makes no sense to you. You're struggling, you're straining, you're pushing. I have to be honest with you. There are many things in my life and many days in my life where I was on the wrong path, not because I didn't love the Lord, because I was trying to run someone else's race. What I thought I was called to do, what I thought I was gifted in, was not what the Lord had for me. My ideas of grandeur, my ideas of what my life would look like. I'm going to go start this kind of business. I'm going to do this. You know why? Because I can do this. And the truth is, it just put me in constant conflict with the very will of God. I had to work, the Lord had to work that out in me and go, what have I skilled you to be? You know what I realized is when I finally yield to that? It's like a breath of fresh air. Yeah. Now it's not that there's not struggle, but I know the struggle is getting me somewhere. I know that I'm on the right path, going in the right direction with the right people around me. I figured, I finally figured out my friends here at this church told me years before I understood it, you're called to be a pastor. And I was like, no, see, I'm the school teacher, and I might go teach in college because I'm good at teaching. They're like, you're a pastor. Yeah, whatever. Hush, you're a pastor. And when I finally figured that out, because I'm slow, anybody slow in the room? Anybody ever need a little bit more help than, than you think you, than you're ready to admit? When I finally just yielded to it and said, hey, I, I think I might be a pastor. I, I think... Do you know what it does? It breaks off every other bondage of you being dissatisfied, unhappy, discouraged. Do you know what I don't wake up in the morning? I am never discouraged to wake up in the morning. On whatever little amount of sleep that I've got the night before, I am happy to get up because I am functioning in my calling and I'm working towards mastery. Come on, that's Come on now. You've got to make sure that you are running in the right lane today. You have got to get an understanding of the skill that God has put within you. And let me say it this way, because this is the way that he, the Lord uh, said it to me. Is it not enough that I've called you to do this? Wow. Do you know what you do when you keep fighting the Lord over what you're called and what you've been skilled to do? When you're fighting to be in a different position because you like it, there's something about the glory, there's something about it because you think it will require less of you, it's less fearful to you, whatever the excuse is, you have a serious, serious problem because you're actually saying that the Lord hasn't skilled you correctly. You're actually indicting the Lord of all creation because you want it to feel and think to match the way that you think instead of the way that he has designed you. Come on, folks, we need to get free of that today. Amen. Look to your neighbor and say, I'm going to get free of this today. Turn with us to Exodus chapter 4. Come on, we are aiming at being mastership builders. The way that you came in is not going to be the same as when you leave. You're going to be skilled in the name of Jesus. Part of that process, like Pastor was talking about, is going through the desert of humility. Here, Exodus 4, verse 1, Moses answered, What if they do not believe me or listen to me and say, The Lord did not appear to you? When we begin to try and act on a skill that the Lord has given us, you know your mezuzah, but you have not yet mastered it and you exert your own force, you end up getting rejected by your own brothers. The very mezuzah you're trying to carry out just slaps you right in the face and says, who made you our Lord and judge? Then you run off to a desert, and God then spends years upon years refining, honing, shaping, and molding you, putting you with just a few sheep to build the skill that you have into a mastership builder. Moses spent 40 years in the desert being trained how to be a master shipbuilder. 
And to the point where he is completely humbled. We see it here in, in Exodus 4. Then the Lord begins to build him back up and build his confidence. Remind him of exactly who he was. And the next thing he asked him in verse 2. Then the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? For those of you guys who have known your mezuzah, you stepped out and tried to act upon it. And you just fell flat on your face. And you're wondering, will God ever use me again? I tried and I failed. I tried and I failed. And then he begins to speak to you and you ask him the same question. But everybody's going to say that God really didn't speak to me about my mezuzah. Look in your hand. Look at what God has entrusted to you and has been there the entire time. That staff that was with him for 40 years was an identifier. It was a sign and a symbol that God was shaping and molding him into a master shipbuilder. He would then be qualified to deliver the people of God out of the clutches of slavery and into freedom that would be led by the fire and the cloud of God. Amen. Moses replied, a staff. <laughs> the Lord said, throw it on the ground. Now, he had been using that staff for 40 years to guide his sheep. But I guarantee you, the next thing that was about to happen, he had never seen before. He took that call of God, that mezuzah that was in his hand, and he threw it on the ground. He was going to let that purpose work for itself. Verse 3, Moses threw it on the ground and it became a snake and he ran from it. I grew up in Louisiana. You learn very quick. You run from all kinds of snakes. That is the kind that dwell in the bayous and also those that are in business. So he saw this snake and he ran from it. Moses was pretty good at running from stuff, right? He ran, he ran from the call of God and now he's running from a snake. But what God was trying to build in him was a confidence that he was a master shipbuilder. That as he released that mezuzah and let it begin to just work, it was going to serve as a sign to deliver God's people. Then the Lord said to him, reach out your hand and take it by the tail, saints. When your mezuzah begins to go to work and it's doing something you've never seen before, even to the point of scaring you half to death and running away from it, you got to reach back out your hand and pick up that mezuzah, grab it by the tail in the name of Jesus. Resurrect that purpose within you and let that mezuzah continue to work within your hand. Come on, that's a good word for us this morning. What's in your hand, church? What's in your hand? What has God put in your hand? Your purpose. What is the staff that you're holding? I don't know what it is. Actually, I do know what it is for many of you. But do you know what's in your hand? That's right. Isn't that, isn't that the question that the Lord has to ask? What's in your hand? Yeah. Why? Because it felt like it was nothing because it was just part of who he was by that point. As a shepherd, spending 40 years there, I promise you, there was not another time when he threw it on the ground and turned into a snake. No. Don't laugh at him for running away. You've run away when God has done something in you that you weren't expecting. You've pushed back and went, whoa, whoa, I don't know about all that. Think, think about both Elijah and Elisha. Elijah had a widow that came and he said, hey, what do you, what do you have in your hand? She's like, all I have is a little flour and a little oil. I'm going to bake a cake and feed my kids and then we're going to die. <laughs> you know what Elijah's response was? It's one of my favorite responses in the whole Bible. He's like, yes, yes, go ahead and do as you have said. But first, <laughs> yeah, yeah, whatever. Keep whining, keep complaining. But first, before you feed your family and die, make me a cake. This is why in Louisiana we always say, are you hungry, baby? Are you hungry? We just want to make sure we don't sin against God. First Kings 17. In other words, the widow didn't realize what she had. She thought she only had a little, just enough to barely stay alive. And once that was gone, there was nothing else. The man of God said he was completely not worried about that. Make me a loaf of bread, a cake of bread first. Because he knew if she acted in response, if she threw it down, it would be the provision that she would need. Think about Elijah in 2 Kings, where he comes along and there's a widow. He says, what do you have? She says, I have nothing at all. 
except for a little oil. What is in your hand? Do you have the perspective that you have nothing in your hand? I, I, I don't know. I don't have anything. How can God use me? Because I want to do this because I don't see what's in my hand. I'm filling my head with other thoughts of what should be in my hand. I know maybe you've never done this, but I asked my wife where the keys to the vehicle was the other day. You know where the keys were? In my hand. She had it in the purse and it was clipped on the side. I had grabbed the keys and began to try to find the keys. Now, you guys have never done anything like that. I'm just sharing how. Have you ever had your hand on what God has already put there and you don't realize that you already have your hand on it? You're looking for it everywhere. I don't know what my mazuzi is. I can't figure it out. What does God have for me? How can I fulfill this purpose? I'm walking amongst the valley of craftsmen. How do I do it? And your hand is on what you need. Your hand is already on it. Look what is in your hand, church. Hebrews 13 and 21 says this, that he will equip you with everything good for doing his will. Either the word of God is true or it's a lie. You either have everything you need for doing his will and that he may work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. You either have everything you need or you don't. Do you know why you feel like you don't have what you need? Let me give you a little, a little clue to life right now. Maybe because you don't understand what he's given you and you're trying to operate in something else. If I'm a painter and I have, give you a vehicle full of supplies for painting and then you have to go do carpentry work, guess what you won't have? You won't have the right tools. You won't have the right equipment that you need. But if you are, if I'm sending you for a painting job and I put you in a painting truck with all the supplies, guess what you have? You have everything you need to do this job. You just got to figure out what the job that the Lord is asking you to do and do that exclusively. With, without losing energy, God has given you everything good for doing His will. Come on, somebody in this place say, God has given me everything. God's given me everything. So quit acting like He hasn't. Quit praying to Him like you don't have what you need already. Quit thinking about it. You're going, Lord, I don't know where the microphone is, but I, but I, need, I, need, I need a microphone, Lord. It's in your hand already, folks. What does the Lord, what has the Lord put in your hand that you're ignoring? What has the Lord put in your hand that he wants you to use and he wants to bless and he wants to multiply? He's put something in your hand. What is in your hand today? What God has put in our hand is a skill to complete his work. Raise your hand if you have a divine call from the living God. Oh, yeah. Every hand should be raised. Because if you're a living, breathing human being, you have a divine call to accomplish something. Let me read to you out of 2 Peter 1, 3. It says, His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. You know, when there's a divine call, there's also a divine power to complete that call. When we are telling God, but I can't, but I don't, but I lack, we are denying ultimately the divine call that He's put upon our life. We are denying His ability to supernaturally move through us to accomplish it. But let's be honest, where our eyes are usually focused is, Lord, I know that you've called me to do something heavenly, great, divine. But I just can't do it with my skill. I can't do it within my ability. You know, pastor brought up earlier, one of the great uh, professions to train you for ministry is sales. And that's because you're constantly having to work with people and display or presenting a gospel that they would accept. And, and you know, with all kind of other side, uh, side effects. Anyway, in that process of sales, God shaped and molded me for ministry. The first sales call that I took, I uh, saw the guy's name. It was an ice company. And I, my hand was trembling as I dialed the numbers. This was back when you had actually a keypad on a, number, on a, a phone. So he, the secretary answers, and I said, may I speak to so-and-so? Well, he's not here right now, or he's busy. I said, okay, I'll call back. So I, I looked up exactly what his name was, uh, just to make sure that was the president. Called back, and I said in a very nonchalant way, hey, can I talk to Gary? 
And she's like, uh, like, I'm not really sure who this is. You sound familiar. Yeah, I'll patch you right through. When he answered, I stumbled over every single word. I was incoherent. I might as well have just been in a coma. And the last thing I said to him was, well, I just want to meet with you to tell you how you can make ice better. It was horrific. I remember hanging up that phone and said, I never want to do this again. Jesus, I don't know why you called me to be in sales. I have no idea what this is preparing me for. It's only highlighting how much of a failure I am. And I don't have skill to do what you called me to do. At that moment, the Lord rebuked me and said, why do you think that it depends on you to complete this call? Why are you wanting to just sit in the skills that you are comfortable with? Because ultimately, you want the glory for it. But if you stretch out your hand and use what I put inside of it, though you are incapable of completing it yourself, I will give you my divine power so that I only receive the glory. Church, the truth is, is we want to be a master when we're still just an apprentice. That is so true. We want to start the race. And get all the glory and feel like we're very, very accomplished. And we haven't put in the time, the effort, the skill. We haven't developed it at all. You can't be desiring a master's level of effect when you haven't put in that kind of work. Yeah. I'm, I promise you. I promise you this is where our hearts are in this place. We want to be considered a master because we've had X amount of time in the kingdom. Maybe you're still on an apprentice level. Mm. Have you developed what the Lord has put in you? Or have you been spending all of your time developing somebody else's gift, somebody else's call, somebody else's whatever you think you need to have? Develop what God put it within you. Amen. Become a master of that. Yes, we're going to help you to do it. Yes, but we're not going to help you to do what God hasn't put within you. If you find the areas of discouragement in your life, come on, listen to me for a second. If you find the areas of discouragement I want to challenge you in this room and those of you listening. I'd be willing to, 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 to stake my name on it. That there are areas in your life where you're thinking that you're already a master when you're not. And that is the frustration. Yeah. That is your frustration. You want to be considered a great godly person. And you just haven't put in any faithfulness to it. Come on. You haven't tried to develop it. Not even a little bit. Come on, let's, let's turn, turn with me to, uh, to Revelation chapter 21. <laughs> Revelation 21 and verse 5. It says this, He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Come on, whatever you've been, if you think that there is loss in your life, God can make it new again. If you need to ask, Lord, help me to know what I'm actually skilled at I, I've done some poor construction. I had the wrong tools. Well, that's, that's, that's one of the most fun things you can do, right? You need to do a job and you don't have the right tools. Anybody ever tried to hammer in a nail with a screwdriver? Every time. <laughs> He's laughing because it's true. <laughs> we, we, had a, uh, we had a house in Louisiana. We moved to Texas. We were going back to check on the house. The renters that we had in the house, they said, there's stuff that's breaking. I'm like, well, we'll be in next weekend. I'll take a look at it. We got, and it was literally just a screw that had come out of a wall plate for, a, for an electrical outlet. Just worked its way loose. They said, well, give me a screwdriver. And they were like, here's a butter knife. And I was like, oh, that's my problem. You just handed me a butter knife because you don't have a screwdriver. I fixed everything in the house in like 12 minutes. Because they, it was literally just the most basic thing. When you don't have the right tools... It could be a problem. We serve a God who can make everything new because you've been building with the wrong stuff. You've been focused on the wrong things. Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Our great God is a mastership builder. He's not going to get it wrong, and he wants to share that with you, if you will. Look back at Exodus 36. Exodus 36. Verse 2, it says, Then Moses summoned Bezalel and Aholiab, and every skilled person to whom the Lord had given ability. Everybody say, given ability. Given ability. And who was willing to come? Now, we were talking about it this morning, and some of the thoughts were, hey, we need to do this and have, we need to be willing before anything else. 
Not in the process of being a master. Anybody ever been really, really willing, but you were just not good at it? You couldn't do it? Yes. I've, been, I've been very willing. I'll, yeah, sure, I'll try that. If God, we were talking about is the beginning of the process is God putting something within you. Him calling and putting his very spirit in you and the skill that you need. And then you have to be willing. This is moving from an apprenticeship to a journeyman. You begin the journey of actually doing it. Until you're willing and obedient, you're not even starting the journey yet that you need. Isaiah 1, 19 says, if you are willing and obedient, you will eat the best from the land. You have to start off with the skill that God has and then be willing to start and engage in the journey so that God can move upon you. Turn with us to John chapter 6. We'll start in verse 16. When evening came, his disciples went down to the lake where they got into a boat and set off across the lake for Capernaum. But now it was dark and Jesus had not yet joined them. A strong wind was blowing and the waters grew what rough. When they had rowed three or three and a half miles, they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on water, and they were terrified. Well, these men are disciples. They're watching a master shipbuilder. They're now sent off on a task and they are coming up against a strong storm. Come on, three or three and a half miles of rowing. You think you'd be a little bit tired? Even to the point you might even think you're seeing a ghost walk on the water. <laughs> Jesus will send us out to go do an immeasurable task. Things that are far beyond just our skill so that he can see if we're actually willing to give it a try and do it. Yeah. We pick up verse 20. But he said to them, it is I, do not be afraid. Then they were willing to take him into the boat. And immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading. Well, how many times has God told you to do something and your skill set was not sufficient enough by itself? And you're exhausting. You're, oh, you're just doing it again. Just do it again. Just do it again. And you're still not getting anywhere. Has anyone ever rowed or canoed in a boat against a headwind? It's the most discouraging thing in, on the planet Earth. I'm putting forth all this effort just to minimally go forward or possibly even go back. But the minute that you have Jesus joined those efforts. You've gotten to that place of exhaustion and you hear his voice. It is I. Don't be afraid. I'm with you. And he joins you in that willingness to struggle through the night. Immediately the task is taken care of. Yeah. Turn with us to 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 20. It says this, in a large house there are articles not only of gold and silver but also of wood and clay. Some are for noble purposes and some for ignoble purposes. If a man cleanses himself from the latter, he will be an instrument for noble purposes, made holy and useful to the master. Are you willing to be made holy in everything that you're doing? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That is what is required. You've got to be willing for him to move in you to be made holy. Are you willing to do this enough? Are you willing to go through the process enough to be on the journey enough that he might mold you and make you into something useful, noble for his purposes, prepared to do any good work? That's what we are trying to work for. In Hebrews 5, 14, it says that we can learn to distinguish good from evil. How? By constantly using the word. Through constant use, through constant progress, through constantly learning and being willing, then we are to be made into something that is fit, useful, prepared for anything that the Lord might want to use us for. Back in Exodus chapter 36, then Moses summoned Bezalel, Oholiab, and every skilled person to whom the Lord had given ability. Say, given ability. Given ability. Who was willing to come. Everybody say, I'm willing. I'm willing. And to actually do the work. This is the level that you finally get to a master builder at. You're actually able to do the work unsupervised, but you got your brother right there beside you. You are competent. You are able. You are willing. And you are doing the work that God put before you. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And here's my advice about what is best for you in this matter. Last year, you were the first not only to give, 
but also to have the desire to do so. Now finish the work. Now finish the work. You've gone through that process of apprenticeship, and you've developed that skill. And that's then transitioned into a willingness of just do it again, do it again, developing as that journeyman. But the whole point of starting a project is that you finish that work. So that your eagerness, your, your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it. Wow. You know what makes you a master shipbuilder? It's not just that you began a work, not that just you got halfway or three quarters through the work, it's that you completed the work. We have work to be done in the kingdom of God in this place. There are more lives to transform. There are more disciples to make. There's more families to send out to the nations and more pillars to raise up as elders in the house of God. Our work is not done yet, but our goal is that every single one of you become master shipbuilders. Amen. Turn with us to John chapter 2. If you have a particular task to get done in your family, who do you usually assign that to? Is there a person in your family that you would assign a task to if, you, if it has to get done? Is there the go-to person in your home? Let me, let me say it a different way. If you really need somebody to help you, I mean, you really need a brother to help you, and you don't have a lot of time, and it's got to happen. Is there a s specific person that comes to mind that you would call? Yes. It's not just the ones who are willing. It's the ones who can actually get the job done. When you're at the workplace, if something has to be done, are you the person that the boss would be like, I need you to do this? Why? Because I need to make sure that it completely gets done no matter what happens. Yeah. The go-to person, that person who is working at a master's level, who, who you can count on. This is what we're looking at. Look at what Jesus does in John chapter 2 and verse 8. It says this, Then he told them, Now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. Jesus is doing his first recorded miracle. At 30 years old, they did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned to wine. You know what's good? Is when you're a master, other people, other master's level people will recognize that. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. I always wonder about this story. Did it turn to wine when they scooped it out of the vessel and poured it into the cup? Did it turn to wine as they were handing it to the guy? They're like, I'm handing him a glass of water. I'm handing him a glass of water. He's like, wow. I don't know when it happened, but there's this miracle. But the servants knew what was going on because they had seen the transition from water into wine. <clears throat> Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests, you know, fed a little bit too much to drink. But you've saved the best until now. You know what Jesus does here? You know what he's showing us? That there was not only a willingness and an obedience, but he was, that he had mastered the call that God put with, within him. He was functioning at such a high level. The water turned to wine. It wasn't just that it turned to wine. It turned to the best wine. That whatever God puts in your hand, the life that he gives you is supposed to become an abundant joy beyond description. That what he has put within you is supposed to be refined and transformed so that it might be useful to the master. Look at John 17, verse 4. It says this, I have brought you glory. This is Jesus speaking and praying to his heavenly father. I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work. Come on, somebody say complete the work, complete the work. you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me you're in, presence, in your presence with the glory I had from before the world began. We bring God glory when we complete the tasks that he puts before us. How do you become a master? You complete enough tasks along the way. You keep working at it and you are faithful over a long period of time and you can get to the point of being a master. The idea that you can be a master of anything on your first week on the job is ridiculous. But I went to college. I don't care. <laughs> Not impressed. That means you have just been given skill. We're just at the apprentice level. Yeah. But, but I've been, but, but I, but I, no, you've got to do the work. You've got to work through being an apprentice. You've got to learn enough about it that you are skilled in anything that might come up and that you can complete the work. Jesus says this. I brought you glory because I completed what you told me to do. How are you doing in completing what God is telling you to do? 
If you've got an extraordinary piece of bread, if you've got an extraordinary sword, if he's given you everything you need, how are you doing completing what God has put before you? Man, God really spoke to me. Yeah, what did he say? Yeah, I don't remember. I mean, we, we're just now in February, right? We, we don't do a big deal of, uh, of New Year's resolutions. Why? Because most people fail at them before the 10th of January. I will do this. I'm motivated. I wrote it down. I bought my gym membership. And at this point, I have not gone to the gym in a month. Man, we can't be like that with the very presence of heaven, of what God assigns us to do. Be faithful at every single task, and you will see. Look in John 17 and verse 18. As you send me into the world, (laughs) Jesus is saying, I completed my task. You know what I want to do now? I want to send you out to help you complete your task. This is what God is calling us to do. Let's pick back up in Exodus 36 in verse 3. And when that encouragement and directive from heaven has sufficiently cut everyone's heart, everyone is committed to completing the task and become master shipbuilders. We see this this effect that uh, that we see in Exodus 36. They received from Moses all the offerings the Israelites had brought to carry out the work of constructing the sanctuary. And the people continued to bring free will offerings morning after morning. There was a continual sacrifice again and again and again because they were committed to completing the task. Everyone was of one heart and one mind. You know, a statement that we've heard many years ago and will continue to repeat, is that the kingdom of God, the accomplishment, the work of God, will not be completed based on the generosity of just a few people. But it will be completed based on the sacrifice of all people. Verse 4, So all the skilled craftsmen who were doing all the work on the sanctuary left their work. And said to Moses, the people are bringing more than enough for doing the work the Lord commanded to be done. This morning we passed around a sign-up sheet of people that will go and celebrate with New Life uh, Fellowship in Victoria. And we're having to call that number down. We're having to choose just a limited number because the building itself can't hold the number of people that I know from this church that would want to go. There was a point in time when this church was started, we couldn't fill up half of that sheet if every member in LCM had signed up to go to Victoria. But what God has done in this place is that he has built a fellowship of craftsmen. We are living in a a community, a valley of craftsmen. And what God has done in all of you is attached your hearts to the vision, and you are equally as committed at seeing the work completed in Victoria as you are seeing it completed here at LCM. Yeah. Read the next verse with us. Then Moses gave an order, and they sent the word throughout the city, uh, throughout the camp. No man or woman is to make anything else as an offering for the sanctuary. But what a great problem to have as a leader. We don't need anyone else going to New Life next week. Please stop bringing your offering. See, you may look at it as a disappointment if you don't end up going. We look at it as an amazing blessing saying, hey, we got to be grown-ups here. We can't go harm our brothers. We need you to stay, but bring your chair so they get blessed. We're asking you to not (laughs) fulfill your vow here, fulfill your commitment. And what we're saying is we're going to have too many people go. We can't do it. But what a blessing. Isn't that a blessing that in the house of God we're, we're having to say, no, we need you to stay here. We need you to be praying for next week at this service here in this building. Let's, let's pray that the Lord will send visitors to us next week, that people might get saved and spirit-filled here, just like we're praying for it there. What an incredible thing. You know, this carries over not only from Bezalel and Aho- Aholiab, but it also carries into the temple. When David is speaking with Solomon, they, they go back and forth, and they're finding skilled and willing men who will help them do all the work of building the very house of God. We, we stay in this. This is why we're doing this. Let's all turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 as we get ready to close. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We've got just a few more passages of Scripture. Let's look at verse 8. 
It says this, the man who plants and the man who waters have one purpose. Do you hear that? There's one that plants, there's one that waters. They each have a singular purpose, but it's working together. You have a singular purpose, I have a singular purpose, and one plus one equals one. Boy, that's a great thing about the kingdom. Me plus my wife equals one. You in your purpose plus me in my purpose, one plus one still equals one. The man who plants and the man who waters have one purpose, and each will be rewarded to his own labor. See, the Lord is so good at this. He can put us all together, have us build something that's incredible, and reward each one of us individually. He doesn't ever take away the individual responsibility. He just puts it in a corporate ehad kind of situation where you get to do it with other people. You get to watch them be blessed. You get to watch somebody become a master in their own skill, in their own trade. And it doesn't take away from me that you're becoming a master in your trade. Amen. We have one purpose. Amen. Just like one life, it spills over. Our family is the same way, isn't it? Yeah. Justin Treister right now and Ella and the kids, they have one purpose, but they're separate. We have two people, but they're one. We have two boys who are growing underneath the purpose of a, of a godly husband and a godly wife. They're going to have their own purpose and it will still be one purpose one day. That's an incredible thing to think through. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. God's building. He is a master builder. Look, by the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as an expert builder as a master builder, and someone else is building upon it. Boy, isn't that the desire of our lives? When you do the work well, someone else behind you can come along and they can build upon it even more. Amen. Man, that's what I want my life to be. Let's look at Revelation seventeen fourteen. Revelation seventeen fourteen. I hope this is making sense to you guys today as we're laying out groundwork here. Revelation 17, 14 says this, they will make war against the lamb, but the lamb will overcome them because he is the Lord of lords and the king of little people. He is the king of kings. In other words, when you become a master, you're operating in a kingly realm. He is our king and he is the king of kings. And with him will be his called. Somebody say called. Called. Come on, that's, that's what, what in, in Exodus it shows us that those are the skilled ones. The chosen. Somebody say chosen. chosen. You know, the Bible says that many are called, but few are chosen. Many have been given skill, but they haven't proved willing and faithful to the obedient process that God has. They don't fail in God giving them something. They fail because they're not willing and obedient. To make it to show that they are actually chosen. The called, chosen, and faithful followers. You can't be a faithful follower unless you've become a master at what you're doing. And this is a beautiful principle that the Lord is sharing with us. Let's turn to our last scripture. That's 1 Chronicles chapter 29. We'll start in verse 1. Saints, what we're trying to do this morning is bring you revelation, bring you encouragement, and sober judgment. What we walk through is that the stages of development of our lives, they begin with an apprenticeship, a a developing of skill. They then mature into a journeyman level. That is a willingness to just do it again, do it again, develop that skill over time. And then by completing the work, we're to become master shipbuilders. Well, this is one of the greatest occurrences of that developmental process. 1 Chronicles 29 verse 1, Then King David said to the whole assembly, My son Solomon, the one whom God has chosen, is young and inexperienced. Come on, God has chosen each and every one of you, but not because you are already a master builder. He chooses those who are young and inexperienced, and I don't mean just by age or natural maturity. You could be in the kingdom 20, 30 years but have not experienced a certain facet of carrying out God's will. And when you begin to, put, begin to put your hands to building something that you're unfamiliar with, you feel young and inexperienced. But God can work through that young inexperience. And that is, the task is great, 
because this palatial structure is not for man, but for the Lord God. With all my resources, this is David's resources, I provided for the temple of my God. See, David, the father, was opening up the storehouses for his son to succeed. He then later goes on to say, I'll even give my personal treasures to make sure that you succeed. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. There's nothing that we lack to accomplish God's will for each and every one of our lives. He then goes on to say in verse 5, For the gold work and the silver work and for the, all the work to be done by the craftsmen, now who is willing to consecrate himself today? Though you have initiated obtaining a skill, maybe even working through the willingness of it, it all begins with being holy. Without being holy, all of your efforts in trying to become a master shipbuilder are for naught. And everything that you build will be that of wood, hay, and stubble, consumed by the fire of God on that day you stand before Him. But if you are seeking, willing, desiring to be holy before the living God, it enables you to not only be a master builder, but to build with gold, silver, and precious stone, stones, things that will last for an eternity and bring glory to God and God alone. I want us to stand to our feet. We have communion available that our elders are going to lead us through. But before we get to that point, I want you, those that are being developed into being master shipbuilders, I want you to evaluate your heart, evaluate your true condition. Please do not go get communion if you are not living holy before the living God. Otherwise, you will sear your conscience, credit yourself for being a master when you haven't even begun to be an apprentice. Let's get sober judgment of ourselves. Let's let the blood of Jesus begin to atone on our hearts and remove what is an obstacle in becoming a master shipbuilder. Let's begin to pray. Mighty God, we thank you for your building process in us the congregation, the assembly, the church of the living God. Father, we ask that your, your view, your sober judgment fall upon us of ourselves and our true condition. Father, that idolatry would be removed in the name of Jesus. Lord, habitual sin be removed in the name of Jesus. Pride be removed in the name of Jesus. Let your humility and repentance fall in this room on these people, on me, as we seek your face. That we might be right before you and able to then have right fellowship with you. Which then enables us to become your craftsmen. We surrender our hearts. We surrender our lives. And we thank you for being our lamb and our Lord.